Just before we get into uh, the teaching that I prepared for you today, I want to give you a little update on Catherine and my week last week as we went to uh, the Twin Cities. But first, you may have noticed that Catherine is not here. And uh, I've, I'm a little bit embarrassed about this, but the reason is she's being prepared to go to prison. <laughs> and next Sunday, during the morning and the afternoon, she's going into lockup. The good news is she's doing two messages at, the, at Marysville Prison for Women. But uh, what, it's very special. She's going with two of her board members, one of whom, Karen, if you were here for our marriage celebration about a year and a half ago or so, or a year ago, uh, Karen gave her testimony of her two daughters who had been terribly sexually abused by their dad, thought their mom was guilty of not protecting them, and they tried to murder her. They were sentenced to five years at Marysville. And now Catherine is going with Karen, that mom, and another lady, and sharing the good news of, of Jesus, uh, the two daughters have reconciled with their mom and asked the mom's forgiveness. And they're, they have just come out of a halfway house. So it's really a, a powerful story and a, and a wonderful blessing. And I'm, I'm thrilled that, that Catherine has that opportunity. Uh, she has been asked to come regularly, at least once a month. She hasn't committed to that yet, but to me that's a, a wonderful thing. So we were in, at, in a city called Hastings, which is on the Mississippi River in outside of the Twin Cities this week for a minister's conference. And uh, it was on Wednesday night that Catherine was ordained. And uh, just a, a wonderful privilege. There were 32 people who were licensed at Wednesday. So we had, a, we had a nice crowd. And one of the things for me that was very special was just the wonderful worship that, that just, it was just absolutely exceptional. And uh, the, the room was filled with about, about 200, 250 uh, ministers and their spouses who, whose job it is to lead worship for their people. But they have, we had no responsibility but to worship the Lord. So it was very great. And uh, so Catherine and I enjoyed that. But I want to get back to the lockup thing for a second. Uh, in my undergraduate years, when sociology was my major, I had a criminology course, and a part of it, we had to go into uh, Columbus to the city jail and literally be locked up. And for someone who has an issue with claustrophobia, that was really challenging. The sheriff's deputy who, who I was dealing with, I told him about that. You know, please don't go away too far. And he said, no worries. So he locked me up left the room. I was starting to panic. And then he came back, just kidding, and, and let me out. And I resolved that I never want to get close to that situation. But so for Catherine, it's a great opportunity uh, to share with women who have made some issues for themselves in their life. So this morning, I want to jump off of the story of Jairus in, in this way, by looking at the, the start of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when uh, the crowds were gathering in Mark chapter 5, and uh, I want to read the first five verses, or first three verses of chapter 5, where it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, and here's the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I want to address the poor in spirit. You heard Dick talk about poor financially, poor physical distress. But here's a different way to be poor, poor in spirit, that that type of poverty is one that, that heaven blesses. The, uh, the Greek word blessed or blessed in the Bible is makarios, and it's the same word that's also translated as happiness. So blessed or happy are those who are poor in spirit or who have a, a poverty of spirit, you could say. And it's one of those things that to me, it's important to grasp. Um, what does it mean for us? That's what I want to look at a little bit this morning. But you know, virtually every Sunday morning when we come together, we 
confess to the Lord that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. That's powerful. That's each of us. We are saying that, Lord, we have failed. And in light of the Sermon on the Mount, we are, we are, we are confessing that we need help from outside of ourselves. We are not able to do this ourselves. Like Jairus, he was at a place where he, he was desperate for an intervention. He could not save his own daughter. He apparently had money, but, he, but it wasn't enough to do anything to save his dying daughter. So he came, fell at Jesus' feet, and said, Lord, would you come and lay hands on my daughter, and she'll get well. He had faith, he had hope, that perhaps Jesus could intervene in his daughter's life. In, uh, in different translations, th this is translated in the New Living, God blesses those who realize their need for him. In the God's Word translation, God blesses those who are spiritually helpless. Think about that, spiritually helpless. In the Contemporary English version, God blesses those who depend only on him. And then finally in the New Century version, God blesses those who know they have great spiritual needs. I'm one of those, and I found the only answer was in a personal relationship with Jesus. And it, it transformed my life. The, the root word for power in the New Testament, to me, I love this, means a person who is reduced to begging. And we see evidences of that in the New Testament. But here, Jairus, who was not poor physically or financially, was begging. He fell at Jesus' feet. Lord, please, you're my only hope. And Jesus went with him, of course. And someone uh, who is begging spiritually, who is uh, destitute of all res resources, and that's the gospel. The only hope is Christ. In the gospel of Luke in chapter 5, Jesus called a tax collector, Levi, who was Matthew, to follow him. And uh, Le Levi or Matthew threw a party for his friends, whom the religious leader said were sinners. And they came to Jesus and asked, how can you eat and drink with sinners? And Jesus said to them, it is not for those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Or said another way, I've come for those who realize they are spiritually broken or helpless. That is who I have come to redeem. And uh, so to be poor in spirit means to recognize my own need and my own unworthiness, that I cannot make myself right to be in God's presence. I need intervention from outside, humbly depending on God instead of myself. How do I do that? And uh, Jairus to me is a great example that when, when you come to faith, you are doing like Jairus did, that you are coming, Lord, I need your intervention in my life or I am lost. And I want to talk about three different ways that uh, being poor in the spirit can be fulfilled in our lives, to, can, can be made real in our lives. First of all, by depending on God's wisdom, not my own wisdom. I know a lot of stuff, but I can't save myself. In Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful progression from what I know to the one who is the source of all wisdom. Understanding comes from learning God's word, from devouring God's word, from putting into myself. And knowledge, rather, understanding comes from learning, and knowledge comes from the experiences and talents that God ha has given me. And finally, wisdom comes from an accumulation of the understanding and knowledge that God has given me over time. That is when I'm able to make decisions that reflect what I believe. In, in Proverbs 14, 12, it says, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. So my own wisdom that I've acquired for myself is not what 
but the Bible is talking about. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 7, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he'll direct your paths. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, respect the Lord and turn your back on evil. To me, that is so pivotal and and foundational for our lives. God's wisdom and God's will are in his word. They are in God's word, nowhere else. So the conclusion of that is that if you're not in the word, you don't know God's will. If you're not daily consuming his word, how can you find direction and peace for your life? And if you're not in the word, you don't have his wisdom. If you don't have God's wisdom, you can't be blessed. That's the focus of happiness and blessing is in God's word. Jairus was like that. He, he, could, he could do nothing but seek Christ. And when he did, the Lord intervened in his life and brought healing to his daughter. An example I had of that, it's not spiritual, but it's, it's a, a time of real desperation when, when our first daughter, Rachel, was perhaps two. She had a high fever, as I recall, about 104, and we didn't know what to do. She was turned bright red. Uh, her heart was beating too rapidly. Uh, her body was, was just giving off just terrible perspiration. Th- this was in a day when you were able to call your doctor. You, many of you are too young for that, but you could call your own doctor. And uh, he said, quickly, put her in an ice bath and bring her to my office, and I will meet you there. And we did. We emptied the freezer, put her in a little ice bath, and she started to shake and wail. But I trusted in the wisdom of the doctor. I put her in the front seat and then on my lap and drove her as fast as I could to the office, and uh, we kept her in ice. And uh, he treated her medically, of course, and very shortly the fever went down. He diagnosed what it was, and by God's grace, uh, she was restored, and we were able to, to take her home. Who do you trust? Whose wisdom do you trust? Jairus believed that the only hope was Christ, and, and that, is, that is such an important part of our lives. And so getting back to that understanding of acquiring God's wisdom, Are you talking to God constantly throughout the day? And are you reading the Bible every day? That's how we go from understanding to knowledge to wisdom. It becomes a part of our life, so we begin to think biblically, and then we begin to act biblically. If I'm not doing that, I'm not depending on God's wisdom. I'm depending on my own wisdom, and I know what that leads to. Then secondly, Poor in spirit means I'm depending on God's strength and not my own. Thinking back a a ways to my dad when he was in his early, I think late 70s, early 80s, uh, we were at our house in Grafton. We moved back from New York, and uh, he was going to help cut a tree, or at least he thought he was, and he took a hedge trimmer up into a tree, and he... He had lost strength. He was, uh, growing up, he was the strongest man I had ever known. And, and so here was this old man, a little bit younger than I am now, climbing up that tree, not able to even hold the hedge trimmer upright. And my brother and I had to rescue him because the, the great strength that he had in his arms was gone. His strength was diminished. And that is a part of how we are as Christians that we have limits. We need to depend on the Lord's strength. In uh, Isaiah 40, 31, you bless those who depend on you for strength. I'm sorry, that's Psalm 84, 5. Then Isaiah 40, 31, those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. Those who trust in the Lord will find their strength renewed. In Psalm 73, 26, my health may fail, My dad's health failed. My spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. A few weeks ago, about a month ago, when I was in the hospital with severe pain and I lost all strength in this arm, 
it reminded me of these scriptures that how, how important it is to not to depend on my strength. I needed help getting dressed. I could not use this hand to even button my shirt. My strength is not in myself. It's in the Lord. In Zechariah 4, 6, it says, not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We depend on the Lord, on his strength, because our strength ultimately can run out. Human strength relies on things of the earth, like food, sleep, exercise, water, sunshine. Those things aren't enough to make us strong in the Lord. We need to depend on his strength. And when we call out to him, that is evidence of poor in spirit, like Jairus. Like when I called our doctor and our, when our daughter, I thought, was close to death. He had wisdom. Then thirdly, being poor in spirit can, is evidenced by depending on God's protection from our lives, not mine. I do what I can to protect my wife. Like many people, I'm armed, but I'm not able to do all that we need to protect ourselves. Psalm 62, 5 through 7, today's English version. This is King David saying this. I, now, remember, David was a, a strong man, a strong king, highly respected. I depend on God alone. I put my trust in him. He alone protects and save me, saves me. He is my defender, and I shall never be defeated. My salvation and honor depend on God. He is my strong protector. He is my shelter. What a, what a powerful confession. When you, when you do what David says, then you are acknowledging that you're poor in spirit. I want to remind you of another familiar Old Testament example of this from King Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 20, verse 12, where he's a, a, the, the king who discovers that his people are being attacked by three other kings, by three other nations, in, in a powerful surprise raid. And uh, King Jehoshaphat prays, and here's what he says to the Lord. Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Our protection is from the Lord. We don't have to live with our guard up constantly because it's jo God's job to protect you. It's God's job to take a role in your life, that his armor is so much superior to anything that you can do for yourself. If we p believe we're our only defense, we, we can live in anxiety, but when we understand that God is our shelter, that we can find safety under his wings, then we understand that no matter what the future brings, ultimately we are kept safe in him into all eternity. It doesn't mean we don't have challenges. It doesn't mean that there can't be woundings, but it means that through it all, even to the point of death, that he is our protection. In the last few weeks, we've had two very special people in our church go to be with the Lord, John Crothel and Joan Joy, whose uh, memorial service is this Wednesday morning. Wonderful examples of people who love the Lord but their ultimate protection, even to the day of their death, is in the Lord. And they have been escorted into eternity because of their faith. It's a wonderful thing. You don't have to be concerned because he is our protection. God wants us to trust our lives or entrust our lives into his hands. Though we're to use our, our own, the wisdom that he gives us, ultimately he's the one who shields and guides us. You know, when you look at the world, I, I read a lot of news. And uh, in a world that experiences wars and rumors of wars, dangers of many different kinds, uh, it's comforting to know that God has promised that his children, his people, he will protect them, no matter what the situation is. We may not all be on the front lines of a natural war, but we all face an enemy who intends to steal, to kill and to destroy. But 
when we are poor in spirit, we are blessed and ultimately find our peace and happiness in the Lord because we receive from the Lord wisdom for our lives, strength to walk the walk that he's given us, and protection from anything that would cease or desire to attack us. That's the promise of the gospel. And it's a part of why we come together to remind ourselves that we are not alone. We are a part of a great company of believers that are depending on the Lord for our guidance, for our direction, and for our protection. So as we come now to that time when we confess our faith, let's stand together and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord,